Thank you, everybody, for coming. I know this kind of got put together within just the last month or so. Um, I actually officially met Niels yesterday. Um, his co-partner, Clamorhead, is a commercial fisherman in North Carolina, and him and I have been friends through Facebook for about three or four years. Unfortunately, I never got to meet him in person before I moved out of North Carolina, but he told me about this biodegradable product that they have, and I just think it's going to be a great alternative to those oyster mesh bags that I'm sure we've all worked on, all been scarred from. Um, but first, I'm just going to give a little introduction in regards to the company I work for. Um, over here, this is Jeff Tilly, the owner and CEO of Oyster Boss. We are a private aquaculture farm in the Panhandle in Alligator Harbor. So we are just east of Apalachicola. I know some of you might not know where that is. I've recently learned all of that myself in coming into this position. So where we are located, so we are all just about over here in South Florida. And where our farms are, we are actually almost just south of Tallahassee, where Alligator Harbor is. And as you can see on the other map, the anchor again, these are our farms in this waterway, and our processing facility is in Sop Choppy. We're currently working with FDAC since we recently purchased that property to get that online with all of our certifications. So not only are we the farmer, we're the grower, we're the dealer. So we want complete control of our product. We don't want it to go on the back of a big truck. Um, so we are actually going to restaurants to sell our product. Um, hopefully early to mid next month, I will be going to restaurants here in South Florida to sell some of our fresh locally grown product. All right, so a little more of a zoom in. So our area is unique in the Panhandle. There's 46 leases. They call that an aquaculture use zone. Those were put in place by the state back in 2002. Um, there's an expansion going on right now for a proposed 21 more leases. So each one of those leases are just about an acre and a half. So it's a giant rectangle. And as you can see, these pinpoints, those are actually our leases, our six leases out in the waterway. So we, uh, we are not a hatchery, so we do not spawn and grow our seed. We get them from approved hatcheries on the west coast of Florida. I'm sure some of you know, so east coast, if you spawn something on the east coast, that cannot be put in the waters on the gulf. But if there's a hatchery on the gulf side, those oysters or clams can, be, can come to the east coast because we don't want to transfer different types of dis diseases and bacteria. Um, we are currently growing two different types of oysters, um, diploids and triploids. Diploid meaning two, so two alleles, they spawn. Uh, we're also doing triploid oysters, ones that don't spawn, um, three alleles. Primarily, most of the farmers out there are using triploid oysters, and I'm not going to get too far into this, but um, we are having shortage of seed primarily with trip boys trying to get the sperm from Four Seas and, and um, the universities. So hopefully this year will be the year change because um, without seed, the industry is going to suffer. Um, these are just some pictures of how uh, the, what we use on our farm. Use the little arrow. So we are currently, we are also a Catchem trap distributor, if anyone's from New England. So Catchem has been in business since 19, 19 something, um, their product is very good. Um, we are, we're from up north, there's a lot of winter storms, so they're very durable. Uh, right here, you can kind of see some of the bags. So we use six pack cages of the Flow and Grow. And, as, and you can see right here. So when they're flipped up, so depending on the time of year, summer is really, really bad or sea squirts amongst a lot of other biofouling organisms. So we, we desiccate, essentially we just, those animals and organisms don't like the sun, so they get baked off a little bit and then they get flipped back in the water. And we have a protocol for that depending upon the time of year and water temperature. 
Um, and down here, you can see, so that's when they're flipped in the water, so they're feeding. And these are just a couple more pictures from our farm. Um, we're hand sorting for our market ready. So market ready is three inches long. Um, here, this was our recent set of seed we got uh, back in December. So I'm just doing a wet pack count to see the growth. And when I first started, I'm just gonna nerd out real quick, but there's a little baby black tip shark that was around. There was, there, I actually saw four different ones. So a lot of people think, oh, it's a lot of gear, you know, what about the animals? But it creates this other habitat for different organisms as well. Um, I recently saw there was some coral growing on some of the rocks underneath our farm, which I'll be honest, I did not know there was coral in the Gulf. Um, and then our half shell market. So we are growing them for the half shell, primarily the half shell raw market. So we really want a nice three inch long oyster with a nice deep cup to have that nice fat plump meat and all the liquid, the liquor in the oyster. So with that, uh, does anyone have any quick question before it's Neil's turn? It roughly takes, during the warm months, it takes about eight to 10 months, but we get them about six millimeters, so thumbnail size, so. Thank you. Yep. Oh, it's uh, great to be here. Nicolette, no. appreciate uh, the organizing, getting together with Jim to pull it all together and to, to host us and give me an opportunity to see more of Florida. I'm a Florida native. I was born and raised in Gainesville. A lot of time in Florida waters. But I've been up in North Carolina now. Without, what I want to do with the um, presentation today is first go through a little bit of background um, on me and sort of how I came to where I am in working with oysters and how that knowledge is helping to, to better understand oyster ecology and get around some of the issues that oysters can face when they're in natural environment. Um, then go through some of those issues we faced in North Carolina and then start the show. I started out as a chemist and in fact Val Paul who's sitting over here from the Smithsonian lab, field station there in Fort Pierce, uh, was a graduate student with Bill Fenical when I arrived. Students together out at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. So my first real research interest was in natural products chemistry and chemical ecology. And um, learning about all the unusual chemicals that plants and animals make, the roles that have, preventing predation, competition, and things like that. It also got me into to larval ecology. I started looking at um, reproductive and, and larval chemical ecology, and a lot of interest in there that really sort of clued me into life history strategies and reproductive strategies, and how to think about those in terms of the life cycles of organisms. Uh, from there, in the Florida coral reefs and in the Bahamas, started working on sponges and carbon and nitrogen cycling. Learned quite a bit about the, the role of sponges in reef environments and basically their little fertilizer factories. The more of them you have out there, the, the more nutrients you have going into the benthic waters, as bottom waters where the corals and other things grow. So they're contributing to some of the excessive growth of seaweeds on some of these. Corals aren't doing quite as well. And in that work, there are you know, are a lot of different types of sponges, and one that's very common on the coral reefs are boring sponges, carbonate boring sponges. Bore into coral heads and excavate basically a safe place to live. And that's kind of what brought me to uh, studying oysters, and it came about through an oyster roast in North Carolina. Trying to shuck an oyster that would just fall apart in my hand. And you know, I looked down at that shell and understood that the problem was it was a boring sponge thoroughly infesting that shell. And that kind of said, okay, sponges are important in oyster reefs as well. I was asking people around the oyster roast, you know, do you know what this thing is? And for the most part, people just didn't know what was causing the problem with that oyster. And that wasn't just people who enjoyed eating oysters, it was commercial fishermen, it was even some of the scientists that we have in Moorhead City and uh, Beaufort doing oyster work. So these are some images of boring sponges in an oyster shell. And when the infestations are bad, I mean, they're really bad. People have been writing about 
boring sponges and their impacts on coral reefs since 1700s and even earlier. I mean, they've been around a long time, so it's not a new problem. It basically became a problem that people forgot about as they started thinking about other issues. The conservation, just the, the way in which organisms are sort of operating in today's world, problems. But up until the 19, through the 1900s and 1975, our area, Moorhead City, Beaufort, was kind of the hotbed of boring sponge research. So it was kind of amazing that it got forgotten. And that's how we started getting money to do oyster reef research, was studying the boring sponge problem in North Carolina oyster reefs. And this was through Sea Grant money, what was called the Fisheries Resource Grant Program. So that was designed to bring commercial fishermen and scientists together to work on problems of uh, estuarine habitats and, and organisms. So two of the commercial fishermen that became involved with us in this research were Adam Tyler, um, Adam's with the tongs here, and then David Clammerhead Cessna. So he's been known as Clammerhead for a very long time. And you know, <laughs> this is how these guys make their living. They're out there all the time, so they have a different perspective, a different world view, the knowledge of the estuary that scientists often don't have. So combining their knowledge and expertise with the science was very enlightening for not only us, but for them quite as well. They thought they knew everything about oysters and then found out they didn't. And I knew nothing about oysters coming in, but quickly learned. And we have a cohort of uh, faculty at our lab, the UNC Institute of Marine Sciences, who have really gotten into oyster reef research since about uh, 2009, 2010. We had some really pretty well-known oyster reef researchers working uh, through the lab and coming through the lab for a decade or more before that. But this group really uh, sort of came about, started looking at oyster reefs from a lot of different perspectives. And we've published some, some pretty good papers that really focus on what is really important in, oil, in oyster reef ecology in North Carolina. And also, you know, that's going to transfer to a lot of other areas as well. So talking about oyster reefs, intertidal reefs outgrowing sea level rise. So that's a you know, wonderful thing. If you're fighting rising sea levels, oyster reefs can, can do a lot of good for you. And just sort of learning about uh, what was driving that and the potential of oyster reefs to help with carbon sequestration and protecting shorelines. And in general, you basically come down to two factors in oysters growing well in estuarine environments. And you know, they're a wonderfully durable and hardy organism. You know, they can withstand temperatures from freezing temperatures, sub-freezing temperatures, to you know, well you know, into summertime in the intertidal environments. So their thermal tolerance is ex you know, exceptional. Their ability to survive being out of the water for extended periods of time is amazing, too. And that gives them quite um, a geographic range to grow across in estuaries. But there are a lot of things that like to eat oysters, not only us, and grow on them, live in their shells, and, and things like that. So there's a lot of pressure on oysters when they're in the water, underwater, all the time. So one environment that's very safe for oysters is that intertidal zone. So I'm sure you've all you know, have seen evidence of that. You see the dock pilings and other things where you get a nice zone of oyster growth and then it just basically disappears at about mean low water. So in very salty environments, lots of predators, lots of pests, they need to be dried out on tidal cycles to really be safe. The other place in estuaries where oysters really have a refuge is where the, there's a lower salinity, and that excludes a lot of the predators and pests. Um, even areas where you can be high salinity but get big freshets that come through, that can be enough to drive out predators and keep them safe. So basically, this is kind of a, a diagram that was put together by one of the um, IMS students, uh, Justin Ridge. And it, it shows you, again, basically those two those safe zones. You've got on this salinity axis, there was a low salinity um, peak here for you know, good oyster growing territory. And then on the, basically the tidal range axis, you've got the subtidal, but in high salinity, it's in, uh, environments, this is really not a good place to grow oysters. So you need to get into the intertidal up to about mean sea level. So right about mean water level is the, the top of where the oyster growth zone is in the intertidal. And you, know, you can use this to just look where you go and maybe you think you've got a place you want to do a restoration project and you want to gain some information about how are the oysters you know, doing there? What's their potential? And if you just look at some of these dock pilings or Sea walls, you can see often the intertidal oyster zone. Here in, in Moorhead City, this we have a tide range of about three and a half feet. So the oysters you see here, this is about 
18 to 20 inches of, of growing potential. And at the base right here at mean low water, you go right below that, the oysters disappear. It's too much pressure. So, you know, thinking about where you want to put reefs in intertidal environments or other places, you can look at that. This is a site that's farther up an estuary in, uh, in the Moorhead City area. And we have a smaller tide range here. This is about uh, two foot. So we have about a foot high safe zone in the intertidal for the oysters to grow. But we also have another area that's uh, a creek that was dug between this um, Noose River um, and the Beaufort Inlet area. So now we have a big freshwater conduit down into the estuary. And if you go to the Noose River and look, what you'll see is that intertidal oyster growth zone where things are really growing very well. But here the salinities are low enough that if you look, you'll see these oysters go all the way to the bottom on that seawall and they're spread out on the sea. So that would tell us we could do subtitle restoration here and have some success as well as intertidal restoration. And I've been looking around the uh, Vero Beach, Fort Pierce area, and this morning I was looking in Vero Beach and at the 60 Bridge in Vero Beach. You basically have the same sort of situation there. You've got there's about a 12, 14 inch zone, intertidal zone of big thick growth, and then below that they continue on down to the bottom. So I think there's a lot of potential in the Indian, Indian River Lagoon. Now this is a, you know, an area of concern, is this pit right here in this fitness diagram. So what happens when you put things there and, and you know, what, goes, what can go wrong? And there have been some problems in, in North Carolina, some with the Oyster Sanctuary Program, which is a big program to create these rootstock uh, populations in Pamlico Sound, hoping to really keep the North Carolina population um, good and recovering. So there are these big mounds, they're six, eight feet high, 50, 60 feet in diameter of marl rock. So that's um, a limestone rock. So that's something that people think is, is really a good growing substrate for oysters because they can use the carbonate. And this is a, some of the, uh, the stars show the location of some of the, the sanctuaries. These two are the ones that really were having problems. And when I was coming into the research, the um, head of the Resource Enhancement Division at the Division of Marine Fisheries, Said that you know we've got a problem with one of these sanctuaries and you come out and look at it so we went out there and you know the problem was it was in a high salinity environment it was marl rock so this is a picture of marl rock and if you cut marl open you see it's already sort of very porous it's a great habitat for boring organisms because it's already bored and they go right into it so you can get the rock that looks like this cut it open the sponge is all the way through the center of that rock so what happens when you get boring sponge growing on that substrate. This is the Ocracoke um, data that the Division of Marine Fisheries collected. And they started putting mounds of marl on the site in 2004. So what this is, you see are the, the condition of the mounds in 2004 with over time. So that number there is the number of months since it was planted. So for the 2004 mounds, they first started doing their surveys in 2007. Uh, we skipped to 2009. Now, 2008 was a problem because that was the Great Recession. Everybody was losing money. They were losing positions, and they didn't have the resources to really go in and, and monitor as, as much as they wanted to or to look at the data once it was collected. But what you can see, the blue is live oyster, and that's, that's good. The red is, you know, obviously, there's going to be dead oyster. But if you look over time, you just see it just flat lines. There's no live oyster. 2006 mounds, they followed the same trend, and the ones that were put in... In 2008, you see there's plenty of larvae here. They're settling, but they're just not living. And by 2009, they went downhill much faster. So, you know, it's, um, it's not a, a place that you wanted to build a reef in the first, in the first place. So three to four years post-settlement, things looked great, and everybody was happy with the progress. And then five to six years, you can see in this image, there are characteristic little of the boring sponge, we got drills, and then at six years, there's no oyster and there never will be. So this is now sitting out there as a big reef full of boring sponge and, and pebbles. Uh, Hatteras was another one that the, was on the eastern side of the Pamlico, salt, very salty. And you can see they started planting in 2002, and by the time they first monitored this one in at 65 months, basically there was no oyster. They started planting some more mounds, and then in 
2010 with the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act uh, funds, they added more and they crashed. So you, know, you really have to be very careful about planning your um, restoration projects and knowing a lot about the environment. So now North Carolina is no longer using marl for these um, sanctuaries in the high salinity and moderate salinity environments. It's just um, something that we've learned is, is not uh, a good thing. They also do cultch planting. Um, so there's a lot of oyster shell that's put on the bottom in North Carolina. So I mean, basically, it's a restoration um, type of uh, strategy that's going to the harvest. And there are similar problems with, with that that also give us some information about oyster ecology and what, uh, what you want to avoid to, to have, not have problems. And so you put the, the shell down, and you know, it's a, a nice bed for the oysters. And we've got um, a really nice system here in the Moorhead City Beaufort area. So the UNC Marine Lab is about here, the Duke Marine Lab over here. We've got a NOAA lab. Uh, NC State has a lab here. A lot of work done in the North River and the Newport River. But this one was uh, a very nice study site because they started planting cultch here in 2004. So you can see them in these images of uh, the shell on the bottom, four, five, six. And so it's got a nice temporal sequence to go in and look at the health of the oysters on these, um, these reefs. But we weren't the first ones to get in there and you know, sort of think about this in North Carolina. In 1904, Grave did similar work, published a paper that basically said, below this line, it's too salty. You know, don't even try to have a, a, you know, a lease to grow an oyster. And that's basically what that was focused on, having leases to grow oysters. This is that, that bridge, so this is where some of that, that cultural planning went to. So here's the bridge. So all these leases were, or all these cultural planting sites were sort of above where Graves said don't plant, but um, you know, it's 100 years later. But this is 2013 data for these different sites. The one that was planted in 2009, there wasn't a live oyster on that site, and there never has been. So it was a poor recruitment year. The sponge got there first, basically took over that reef, and you'll never have another oyster. 2010, we had a lot of great recruitment, but what's happening is that first cohort settles, grows up really well, the sponge comes in later, but then you get no recruitment behind it. So it's kind of a one and done situation. So here in 2010, both at this site below the causeway and this one above the causeway, we've got some beautiful oysters, but then they very quickly sort of went the path of the oyster sanctuary reefs as well. 2011 followed the same trend. 2012, again, it's sort of a poor recruitment year for that system. There's no oysters on that reef. You know, so it's um, an indication that you've got to be very careful about what you're planning and, and what you expect to get from that. And, you know, this is a picture of a, a sponge-infested oyster shell, and you can see there have been spats settling. And here's a a juvenile oyster that settled it looks like it was killed by the sponge because the top bow is still on there. And you see the sponge sort of boring through that. You open it up and it's just a, a sponge filled cavity. So now, in today's world, what we'd want to do is probably draw a graze line up here at the head of the, the estuary. So all these former reefs are now in a place that really is not appropriate. So, in terms of thinking about historical distributions and where you might put a reef, you've got to be very careful think about what you have today, not what they had back, way back when. And this is a, an interesting site here above the causeway because we found a relic reef buried underneath there in about 25 centimeters of mud. And it looks like after we had excavated that reef, that that was an event that just buried that reef because we were pulling out boxes when we pulled that reef up. And when you looked at the length frequency distribution, it was beautiful. Lots of small, medium-sized oysters, large oysters. And it had boring sponge, but it had a type of boring sponge, it was really more low salinity adapted. So we can kind of look back and get some idea of what the salinity regime was like. So it's much lower than it was today. And that allowed those reefs to evolve, but it's not good today. But in thinking about the substrates, you know, sort of moving towards this in, in a minute, but we had a, a project funded where, okay, if we have carbonate substrates and they're going to be a problem, let's try some other things. So we tried granite and crushed concrete. And we built reefs in the Newport River and in the North River at each of these sites, um, four to five different sites in each river across that salinity gradient. These are all subtitle reefs, so it's okay. What are we going to see here as we look over time? And these were planted in 2012. 
And this is um, a figure where we got data on the length frequency of oysters on the marl. So live oysters is green. Red is um, just dead oysters, so recently dead. And you can pretty easily discern those. So we have data for marl, for shell, uh, granite, and concrete. And this is a site that's very salty, but you, know, you can see here, now four and a half years later, there are no big oysters on this. They get wiped out of the juvenile stage every time. So it doesn't matter what you use here, it's all bad. So you know, again, be careful where you put things. That line I drew in the North River, we built reefs above that, and this is what we get with that, um, that site. So we get really nice live oyster distribution. Of course, some of them are going to, to die. The gray and black in these um, bins is oyster, live oyster, or shell that was infested with sponge. Um, we can tell live and dead, so it leaves a really nice signature. Either there's tissue or there's not. So we can also characterize it as live or dead, which would suggest there's been a freshet through there recently and knocked it back. So this is a site, again, where material didn't matter. They all did well, but you know, it was a great environment for oysters. Now this is a site that's farther up the Newport River. It's still pretty salty. It will get some freshets. And this is only two years into the study here. But you can see this is a great area to grow oysters. They grow fast. They grow big. And so two years, we've got oysters that are pushing five, six inches. Um, but you again, begin to see on the marl and on the, the shell you know, a lot of live sponge. So those black, that black that's filling those bars is indicative of sponge coming in. Granite and concrete look pretty good. There's not boring sponge. So substrate matters. So that's kind of what got us thinking about substrate. But now at that site, you look four and a half, five years in, you know, it's beginning to show the same sort of decline as the oyster sanctuaries. And so that's a, you know, a problem that you have to be aware of. Um, granite, concrete, you know, they're doing a little better, but still they're having some problems too. But you could get some advantage of using a non-carbonate substrate in some of the restoration projects. We also had Hurricane Florence come through here, so we had a big freshet and probably you know, did some good in taking the sponge out of this system for a period of time. So I imagine they're, they're doing pretty good. But then there was also another factor that we came across in this experiment, which is kind of telling as well. This is an experiment where we had oyster shell with and without boring sponge and spat settled on those. And we hung them side by side in these strings and had them at different sites in the estuary, so at these different reef sites. And you know, don't worry about the data too much you know, here that I'm showing, but at this one site, which is most upstream and had the biggest freshet impact, we've got this multiple stressor effect going on. Because when you take a oyster, baby oyster, growing on a sponge-infested shell and get hit it with a big freshwater pulse, they died. 10, 15 centimeters away, a string hanging with no boring sponge, those oysters had no problem at all, and so you can see the difference in the, over time. So, you know, there's just a lot to sort of think about when you're planning an oyster restoration project and, you know, really trying to hit these high spots. Um, and what restoration, pro, you know, strategies that are working in one place don't always apply to, to another place. You know, if you think about North Carolina here with the Pamico Sound. You know, we've got the Outer Banks, we've got inlets in the Outer Banks, and here's the mouth of the Chesapeake. The mouth of the Chesapeake is really a constant feature. It's a fairly constant salinity, you know, environment to work with. Here in North Carolina with the Outer Banks, things change dramatically over time. So this is a, where you see a red dot, there was an, an inlet in the Outer Banks. So starting in 1600, there were 14 inlets. We had oysters growing up at the Virginia border in Currituck Sound. And then over time, just naturally closing up or opening in storms, you know, we went from 14 to as few as four in 1925 and then back to about six now. So in North Carolina, things are changing sort of at decadal timescales. And you know, you've got to look at the history of your system too to get a, a good handle on how you're going to be successful. And then thinking about going forward, you know, it really gets even more complicated with sea level rise. But the issue of salinity is something you need to be you know, very conscious about and try to find the best data you can. We couldn't find good data in North Carolina because it was just scattered among so many different agencies and academic programs that we were funded to pull all that together and we created a, a water temperature and salinity database for North Carolina with about two million records in it. So We've got a, a decent uh, 
set of salinity uh, records to work off of. And if you sort of look at what these data can tell you, this is shellfish sanitation data. And you, know, you do have a shellfish sanitation program in Florida. And if you haven't tapped into their data, you probably ought to look at it because you know, they're collecting a ton of salinity data, temperature data. Um, and it really is very, very helpful. In North Carolina, it covers almost all our coastal waters. But when you plot, in this case, individual stations that had more than 30 samples, and you take the mean salinity and the standard deviation of the mean salinity, you know, obviously you see very little variation at high and low salinities. But as you get into those mid-ranges, you get areas where there's more variation. And that may be a better target for doing subtitle reef restoration, because you know you're going to get freshets in here more frequently than you will down here. So again, if you've got the data that can really inform you about how to, to best do the work, you know, really go for it. You know, our coastal environments are changing as well. We're dredging inlets. We're doing all sorts of things to it. And that's you know, the case in North Carolina as well. In 1936, uh, there was not much of a dredge channel here in Beaufort Inlet. The state port, we have a state port in Moorhead City. So you know, they really went in and dredged uh, this channel and that inlet uh, quite deep. So now we've got much more salt water intruding into that estuary. And again, that's sort of like thinking that you know, you've got to think about what you have today. You can't always rely on what you, you know, historically it looked like. And now we've got sea level rise considerations. And if you haven't seen this site, um, it's the NOAA, tides and currents at NOAA.gov, and then it's just SL regional for sea level regional. Uh, it takes a look at some of the different coastal regions of the U.S. and says, okay, how are each of these responding to um, the, the changing environment, and what do we see there? So this is kind of the global um, sea level rise curve here. These are the different scenarios. And then they break it down by these regions. And if you look at the southeast, uh, the South Atlantic coast, from about 1990, you see this pattern, where it was fairly flat in terms of rising sea levels. And then about 2010, things changed dramatically. And up in North Carolina, to us, it was, it was obvious, because we were out working on intertidal flats and sandbars and started out with four, six, seven hours of working time. And today, we're lucky if we get three or four. And I don't know if you have a perception that things are different now than they were just a few years ago, because they are. Um, and what I've done, if you haven't sort of looked at the NOAA Tides and Current website, it's really very informative. You can pull a lot of interesting information off of that. So this is for the Duke Marine Lab, where they have a NOAA water level monitoring station. These are the mean monthly water levels um, from about 1973, when they first started recording, to um, 2018. And you get the annual cycles. You know, you get your higher waters in the summer when it's warm. In the winter when it gets cold, that's um, when you get to the lowest water levels, or you should. And this is sort of the trend for Beaufort. 2009 was a really anomalous year. It, um, NOAA even pegged it as that. It was water level that was high for months at 18 inches above predicted. Then it dropped back down, but now you see this curve that started in 2010 to about 2014, and now it's been fairly stable. But you know, this is six inches, five, six inches of water level rise in about five years, and we're holding up there. So it's, uh, it's difficult to work. More, as much as we used to. If you go down to Savannah, you see the same trend here in that 2010 to 2015 time frame. And so you know, we see this kind of flooding more consistently up in our areas, and I'm sure you see it down here as well. Now here's some data for your area, uh, Trident Pier, Port Canaveral. You know, fairly stable, but then here in about uh, 2010, there seems like there's been a rise in your area as well even down in Key Biscayne, that kind of changed about that same time frame. And it continues on into the Gulf of Mexico. That was a pattern that went from Cape Hatteras all the way through Texas. If you went above Cape Cod, which was predicted to be the sea level rise hotspot sort of during this time frame, their water levels dropped by five inches. So there are a lot of predictions out there, but what really happens, sometimes you, know, you get surprised, that's for sure. Um, but you know, Cedar Key, Looks like you've had some water level rise um, near Fort Myers and Charlotte Harbor, some increased water levels, probably you know, meaning higher salinities, because that's more seawater coming in. And here in Pensacola and Apalachicola Bay, you know, here's Apalachicola Bay. They started having problems with the oysters. 
around 2010. And you know, this is a time when they now have more salt water really pouring into that estuary. There's been a lot of concern with the flow out of the river. That would have, there was a drought in 2012 that really brought it down, but now it's sort of back up where it should be, but you're still having problems. So I think this is something that people need to think about as a factor contributing to problems in Apalachicola Bay, and we've got to basically work to restore with this in mind. So now we sort of get to this tackling the challenges of coastal sustainability with rising sea levels, and we're going to do that with oyster reefs and salt marsh. The plant communities are really you know, a valuable protection for, for coastal environments. And so you know, in our areas, we're seeing marsh eds that are being eroded away like this in front of houses, bulkheads, seawalls. And so people are responding with trying to fortify them with uh, bagged oyster shell, uh, rock revetments, big structures like this one up here. Reef maker blocks, um, and then some sills back here. You know, some of them work pretty well, um, but you know, they're expensive and they're big. So we started thinking, Clamorhead and I, because you know, Clamorhead had been involved with all this work, and started thinking, you know, is there another way that we can sort of do business trying to restore oysters? And just started playing around with some ideas of using plant fiber cloths. So. The idea was to take these, and this is jute erosion control cloth. You know, it's very common. You can see it on the side of roadways. People use it to control erosion. And we thought that you know, if we infuse that with cement, harden it up, you know, oysters really love a hard substrate. It doesn't really matter what it is. And then we had an opportunity to come up with a, a design that would fit different purposes in restoration. So that's how we started turning to the idea of using these materials and started coming up with a whole range of shapes that we could put out to capture oysters or to protect salt marshes. And these are just some of the shapes that um, you know, we've been creating so far. And there's a lot of opportunity to come up with other designs that would you know, be appropriate for um, some particular use that you might have. So what I'm going to do is go through some examples of um, what we've been doing with this material. And this started in 2005, uh, UNC Office of Technology Development funded a pilot project and had some great results from that. We filed patent applications, UNC did. And we have patent applications on this material filed in the US, Australia, uh, New Zealand, Canada, and Europe. And then Clamorhead and I are co-inventors of the material. And we co-founded uh, Sandbar Oyster Company and you know, we did that to sort of bring these fundamentals of oyster ecology and this new material to sort of facilitate habitat management, restoration, aquaculture, and you know, economic development as well. So we have Sandbar Oyster Company, and we're, as you've seen our logo before, you realize this is a silhouette of an oyster catcher, and so we've named our product Oyster Catcher for um, oyster habitat restoration. But we've had a lot of help from different groups within the university. Uh, sort of move this company along in this effort and bring this material out to have a, a good impact. NC Idea gave us a $50,000 startup grant which we've been building from, and the Coastal Federation in North Carolina has been very um, helpful too. So we started the oyster growing operation to grow oysters, and we focus on these intertidal habitats because it's a good, safe zone for, for growing oysters. And here in the Newport River, this sandbar right here next to Beaufort, blow it up, and here you can see what our lease looked like back in 2015, 2016. So we haven't been going at this very long, about three years on this site, but we've been having some big impacts out there, big positive impacts. We're growing oysters, but we're doing it in a way that we're altering this, this habitat, this reef flat, uh, the sand flat, which you see here. So you notice it's fairly hard sand, very um, flat. And we put our materials out here, and this is uh, in 2015. And this is um, different forms of our material that we've created reef platforms with. Um, we had some crab pots, too. We'd used them in previous, previous experiments, cut out the trapping parts, dip them in cement, and used them in an experiment looking at tidal creeks and oyster distributions and moving reefs across uh, the creek um, salinity gradient. So we had these laying around, so we put them out there. And they catch oysters really well, too. But they're starting to fall apart. But this is kind of a, a view of what our reefs can grow into. So this reef here, this line of uh, our materials, turns into a reef that looks like this. What you also see 
We're also changing that sedimentary environment. Now we've got more organic matter going into that as well. We're also beginning to trap more sediment in behind it. So we're bringing the elevation of that sandbar up, which you know is largely appropriate just for um, sand. I mean, it was too shallow for seagrass, and uh, the oysters just weren't there. So what we're doing now is, is taking this acre, 1.3 acres, and we have fringing reefs around it. And you can see here, Clammerhead standing on this bar that before was kind of uniformly flat. So what we have is you know, him in shin deep water, but up here we've got dry sand. So we have brought the elevation up to a point where we can actually put salt marsh out there now. So we're planting salt marsh on our lease. And we can do that to sort of help control some of the flow and make some better environments for growing oysters if we take them out of the cages. And that's what we're working to do too, is to grow oysters in a more natural reef situation. What you see here at the bottom is, is some of that reef area on our lease. So we're looking to try to get away from gear, cost, um, just the labor, and um, grow oysters free on bottom. And we think we can get you know, a lot of extra ecosystem services. You're gonna get some great services in while they're in the cages, and the cages are substrate or habitat. You know, we've got a group up in North Carolina, Joel Fadre, who's sort of quantifying that right now, and those structures do a, a, attract a lot of fish. But here, naturally, you know, we can see this grass taking off on this lease, and here's the silhouette of a flounder that had settled in on this little patch um, at a high tide and then, then moved off. We're also um, coming up with different designs for different purposes, and this is kind of our, our tuft. It's an oyster shell substitute. After the talk, you can come up and you can see some of the, the pieces here. Uh, but it's just basically a strand of cement. It'll dip in, in cement and create a, basically a three-dimensional pretzel. And you can get a lot of oysters settling on that, but it's not like an oyster shell where they settle and then grow up as a big cluster that really you can't break apart. And with this, over time, you can get a cluster of oysters like this, which could be 100, 150 oysters, and you can just twist it and they fall apart. And then you get single oysters for a half-shell market, seed oysters. So we're creating sort of natural diploid seeds. So we're taking whatever comes to us you know, from the natural wild population and creating either seed oysters that we can use in aquaculture or for restoration. So we also get the remnants that we haven't stripped everything off of. You have clusters that we can then put back free on bottom. And they also are more resilient towards being washed away when they have sort of uh, this other structure with them. And so we're, we're looking at going into a um, multitude of environments and different benthic environments, subtitle environments, to, to do um, reef creation with these. And here's a, an example of Clamorhead pulling up some oysters that we put out on our substrate on a, a benthic lease farther up the river. So we did this in the fall. We moved our oysters off the intertidal bar in the fall where now our predators are leaving the system. Uh, the boring sponge is done reproducing. So we can put our oysters out in subtidal environments where normally they would be you know, subject to predation, subject to boring sponge infestation. And they've got about six months of growing time without those kind of problems. So we get oysters that grow big. And when the predators come back in in the spring, they're more resistant to, to predators. And we get some, some really good survivorship and growth. Uh, we're creating what we call a patty, and there's an example up here. And this is basically a little reef unit that has a lot of, sort of structure to it, a lot of space that spat can settle into. And again, keep them in the intertidal environment. They grow up safe, grow up big, and then you can transplant those to different areas. And out, over time, you can get a reef, a little mini reef that looks like, like that. And I've got an example up here of that. And we're using these in a project called the, the Oyster Highway Project in uh, New River in North Carolina. And this is the sort of the brainchild of the stormwater manager for the city of Jacksonville. And her um, motivation is to, to clean up the New River more than they have. They've done a great job over the last 20 years with um, going off septics and really cleaning up the wastewater treatment plants, both for the city of Jacksonville and Camp Lejeune. But in the New River, this line right here is about the limit of oyster distributions. You find the oysters down in here on culture planting sites. They're really abundant down here in the lower part of the estuary. But here in this section of the, the river, the salinities are good. Uh, the water quality is decent, but there's just really no larval 
uh, delivery to that part of the estuary. So the idea is that we're going to use these patties, these little mini reefs. We're going to start them down here on these intertidal flats, grow them up for uh, a time, and then once they get big enough, we'll take them up and build reefs at these different sites and try to create broodstock populations where none exists and hopefully get the spawning going in this part of the estuary and retention of the larvae and basically create oyster habitat where there previously is none. This site is a, an artificial reef, concrete bridge rubble they put down. So they've not had good recruitment on that site, but we moved oysters there on our patties in 2015 in December, and the Division of Marine Fisheries did that and followed them for two years. So we had really pretty good survival and growth. Um, we did begin losing oysters. The population was declining over time, but then we had no replenishment. So basically it was going to fade out. So we're trying to solve that problem. And this is a, a, a project that has a lot of partners, um, including uh, the CCA in North Carolina has contributed money as well as a lot of volunteers to, to moving patties around. Um, North Carolina Habitat Wildlife Foundation, the state of North Carolina has put a fair bit of money into this as well. So it's been a big collaborative effort and it's ongoing right now. This is a, a few images of you know what we're doing with the, the patties. We put them on this the PVC poles, and then we build these racks and find that intertidal sweet spot, put them there, and then they get covered in oysters. They grow up for you know, a good period of time to get much bigger, and then we are moving those up to higher parts of the, the estuary. We're also doing reef building with what we call bones and rastas, and these are names that Clamorhead typically is applying to them. But the, they're basically linear pieces of, of the cloth. Uh, the bone is kind of like a hip bone, about that size, so that's where that came from. The rasta looks like a dreadlock. You know, it's a lot of rough surface, a lot of space for little oysters to settle into and be um, protected from predation. So this is um, an example of the first reef we built with this, and we first tied pieces together with wire, and that's why we went to the, the bone with that saddle. Now we can just put uh, the linear pieces across rather than trying to hold them up with, with wire. That didn't uh, always work so well. But this is an example of what this reef turned into. We had this bottom layer that was made with just um, you know, these naked pieces we put out there. Great recruitment, great growth, and then we added additional layers to it because we had more space above in that intertidal growth zone, so we went in and brought new material in. But one thing you can see, we have sort of the same depth when we built this around the reef. Here, a little over uh, a year later, we had sediment deposition within the reef behind the reef, and it had come up enough that we could go ahead and put salt marsh in right behind that reef. And so this has uh, been a patch that started expanding very quickly during that first growing season. And it, um, you can see here at the back side of the reef how the sediment has come up uh, enough that it, it's a good growing environment. And now we're seeing you know, really lush salt marsh plant growth here. But what also looks like occurring is we're getting a facilitation between the oysters and the salt marsh. So the waste products, the metabolic waste products of the oysters are basically fertilizing the, the salt marsh plant growth. And so I had a, a student do an experiment with some of those crab pots where we had crab pots coated in oysters, plants behind them, crab pots with just shell, plants behind them, and then no uh, protection. And those plants growing behind the crab pots that had live oysters, just, I mean, they're substantially bigger, more uh, seed and flower stalks. So, you know, it looks like the closer you can get your, your plants, if that's part of the restoration target as well, to the live oysters, the better you know, that could be. So. One strategy could be to build a sill, let some sediment build up behind it, good oyster cover, get your plants behind the sill, not on the shore, behind, way behind. You know, try to get the plants growing out behind that sill and let them grow back towards shore. And I think that uh, you know, that might be a much better strategy. So this is uh, what the reef looked like this summer in the salt marsh growing in behind it. So very uh, lush growth here. This is another reef, Clamorhead calls it the Bahama Reef because it points straight south towards the Bahamas where we are because we're a, an east-west facing section of the, the east coast. So when we are looking off the beach in, Nor in uh, Moorhead City or Atlantic Beach, we're looking to the Bahamas. But it's another reef that um, you know, has done very well right off the shore of our marine lab and we have the intercoastal waterway right here. So you can see we get big waves coming in on the shoreline all the time. Yeah, so it's also salt marsh, you know, is another 
habitat that is um, you know, exceptionally valuable and one that people really would want to keep intact and restore. And we have a lot of problems with salt, mar salt marsh erosion in North Carolina. This is um, the Brunswick Town Fort Anderson State Historic Site on the Cape Fear River. And you can see you know, how much is, is happening here with the erosion of the, the salt marsh. And the tide range in this area is about six, seven feet. So you know, this is a fairly tall shore here. But one of the problems this shore faces is it also has uh, ship wakes. So cargo ships headed up to the Port of Wilmington uh, create a real problem on this one. But in you know, our area in Moorhead City, Beaufort, with that three foot tide range, we're seeing a lot of uh, this type of erosion. And we are using what we call the log to tackle that problem. So in less energetic environments, you can use coconut fiber bio logs to put along a salt marsh edge that's eroding and protect it and try to grow that back. What we created is sort of a hardened, porous version of a biolog. So we can pack these in along an eroding shoreline. They'll begin to accumulate sediment. They'll break the wave energy, accumulate sediment, not only behind them, but within them. And it's a porous structure, so the roots of the salt marsh plant can go through that and grow out. So we're trying to create a progressive shoreline rather than creating a hard stop with these products. And this is an example of where we used um, some of this for the first time. So we had this shoreline that was uh, retreating fairly quickly. And we put our, our logs along that. And the sediment came up very quickly, started building in, and then we started planting uh, Spartina, alternate flora in there. And over time, what you begin to see is the plant roots are growing through, the sprouts are coming up. And what we expect to see over time is that we're just going to not see these anymore because they're just going to be covered up with, with Spartina. And then we can do another row out that if, uh, out if we, we want to do that. Uh, this is a project that we started this summer at the Rachel Carson National Estuarine Research Reserve in, near Beaufort. And so this is a part of that reserve called Carrot Island. And there were three sites here where we're working with uh, Rachel Gitman at ECU. And um, we had funding from SARP and the North Carolina Coastal Federation is also involved in this project as well as the reserve staff. Um, so there's a, a tidal creek along this edge where we, we constructed reefs with our materials. Uh, an exposed shoreline out here, it's kind of a ramped uh, edge, and I'll show you some of that. And then where we have some of these eroding scarps on the marsh edge as well. So we tackled these two first, and people had tried to restore a reef out there with just loose shell. You know, it worked in the Tidal Creek, it didn't work out here. But this is um, what some of these look like, these shorelines. So this is the, the Tidal Creek shoreline here that we began building reefs on. This is that ramped shoreline. So it's retreating at about a meter, meter and a half a year. So it's a pretty quick retreat. Um, if you go a little further to the east of that other side, this is the, the scarp edge that we got to sort of jump in and tackle. And when I get back at the end of this month, we're going to start building reefs out here. We've also been working with the Nature Conservancy up in uh, Virginia, the Virginia Coastal Reserve in Bo Lusk. And they've got some real problems up there. They've got a bigger tide range, so their problems you know, are a little bigger in terms of the erosion. So we're going to try using some of our materials up there uh, this summer to tackle some of the, the erosion problems. Um, but the Carrot Island reefs were built with basically the bones, the rastas, and, and the logs. And for this project, what we had done was preceded the, the rastas. So we bundled them up, put them out on our lease in the Newport River, our, in Newport River, and pre-coated them with oysters. So go in with a, a lot of oysters already. But this is an example of sort of the, the reef building crew back in the Tidal Creek. Um, we didn't use the logs out here. It's a fairly soft sediment out here. You can sink up to your calf or knee in some places along the shoreline. It's very soft. Um, one thing we're finding is our, our materials work really well for keeping the vertical um, position so they don't sink once they go in. Sediment comes back in around them and then because of that rough surface they pretty much are locked in place vertically. So this is what that uh, reef looked like when we were finishing that up. And this is what it's looked like over time. So here in May, soon after we, just after we finished, you can see that we've got this framework, sort of a three-dimensional framework. It's not a pile of uh, oyster shell and or rock where you want to you know, have oysters growing on the surface. Here we're growing throughout that uh, volume of this, this reef. So in June, it, uh, it was looking pretty good. But one thing we started seeing as we were going through time is we started seeing the sediment accumulating 
under this reef very quickly. And so here, just first of January this year, you can see we've got a lot of sediment building up already in this, this reef uh, framework. And you know, that can be a good thing if you want to grow your marsh out, because now we've brought the elevation up, and so it looks like this. And part of the project uh, goals going forward is to, was to look at the uh, response of the salt marsh in behind the reef, but now what we have is an opportunity to actually go into the reef and plant um, within these, these pockets. Uh, shell bags were also used in that um, tidal creek as well, so there are some shell bag reefs back there, and they're doing pretty, pretty well. So these are um, some images of building the reef out on that more exposed uh, ramp salt marsh, and so we start with the logs, come in, add the, the bones that are the vertical part to hold up the, the rastas, and um, just some examples of sort of the progression of the, the reef construction. And so we walk away and have something that looks like this. Now, this year, you know, it was pretty bad for North Carolina. We had Hurricane Florence. You guys had Michael, but we did too. And so, you know, our reefs went through some fairly um, intense stress tests. And this was water level data and wind data for the Beaufort water level station. You see, we had a storm surge in here that went up about uh, four, four foot almost in this one particular area. We had winds that came out of the north that was kind of an, an unusual direction to start out with, and then it switched to the southeast. Um, so it wasn't really a true onshore wind for that site. So the water basically came up, ran over the whole site. Everything did fine. The shell bags, our reefs, no problem. Michael was a different beast for us. I mean, obviously a real beast for Florida. But water levels didn't go up that much, but we had onshore winds that uh, they got pretty strong for a while. And it was pretty brutal. And then also this month in December, there were two fairly big storms. You see these wind events here. This one was, again, was a north wind. It wasn't so bad for that particular section. This uh, storm here was one that, again, big south onshore winds. And it really did some, some damage, some, sort of a close-up of the, the water levels in the, the wind direction. But this is a, an example of what happened with one of the control sites out on that ramp reef. So this is before all the hurricanes, and so that's where that marsh edge was about eight months prior. But now, what you see here at January 1, we've lost quite a bit more shoreline. The salt marsh has been beat up pretty badly. Um, the shell bag reefs out here, they built four reefs out of shell bags, and after Michael, Florence, it was not so bad for them, but Michael did a lot of this damage, and then this December storm sort of added to it. So this is what's happened with shell bag reefs. They were out there and they began to have oysters settle and grow on them, but not, uh, they didn't have a lot of time to sort of grow and consolidate. Um, so they got blasted apart. Uh, one of the reefs you know, survived relatively well, but um, you know, it did suffer some damage as well. But the reefs we constructed, you know, this is what it looked like before the hurricanes, and this is what it looked like on the 1st of January. So basically we didn't lose an oyster on this, this, uh, these reefs at all. And just to give you some other views of you know, what they're looking like now, you know, sort of a side view, and then looking down from on top. And you see where we have those intersections that you know, we had great recruitment, great growth, and those things are just sort of getting just sealed together with that interlocking oyster uh, shell growth. So it's a, you know, a really robust reef at this point. It's, it's not something that's going to go away very easily. And if you look at it from underneath, you can sort of see the growth now coming down. So we're kind of looking at going to the top of the oyster growth zone and growing down rather than starting with something on the bottom and trying to grow up. So I think there's advantages in trying to do this in a lot of respects. Uh, for the salt the scarp marsh edges, we're going to be using a, more of the logs in a combination that looks something like this, and we're building something that's equivalent to a retention fence, a sediment retention fence, with our materials that we'll insert in here just to ensure that the sediment that washes over accumulates and we can get a a bed of sediment for plant growth uh, established more quickly. Uh, so we started along that line of um, reef building with the North Carolina Aquarium uh, this summer, or just actually it was in s September, just before Hurricane Florence. We got started with a small section, and then Florence came through. And so we haven't been able to go back and build more yet, but we're doing that. But this is what Florence did to the hurricane to the uh, dock at the North Carolina Aquarium which is about four feet above water level, so it tore it up. We had a big storm surge. But this is the condition of the reef after Florence came through, and it looks just like we left it before. And now in October, oysters are getting bigger. 
So we're beginning to sort of get that response that we were anticipating. Um, you know, here in Florida and a lot of other places, you've got a lot of reefs that are just sort of been you know, over harvested. Um, they just don't have much live oyster growth on them. You get a lot of shell. And the same thing in North Carolina, we get uh, those sorts of things. And this is right behind uh, the Marine Lab where we had an, a restoration project going on with oyster shell, and I'll show you the evolution of that. But this summer I went out and just put a small little reef of our materials out there in, June, uh, in July, and by you know, January this year, it's, it's looking pretty, pretty beefy. But this is what it's built on. There was a restoration done with these two lines of loose oyster shell. And this one was a little further offshore. This one you know, was really collecting some nice oysters. This one was put a bit deep, a little too deep. So that outer margin didn't get good recruitment and growth, and it just started rolling over. The boat wakes in particular were pretty bad. So what happened over time is that outer row got washed over the back row, killed the oysters that were growing there, and then the whole thing's now moving back towards shore. So you can see this structure here in this last picture is somewhere in here. So pretty soon all that shell is going to wash into that marsh that was planted, and there was a, a similar row planted on the other side of the, the dock, and it didn't do so well. But this reef that's out on this, move, move, uh, this moving shell bed you know, has really come along quite well. So you know, we've got uh, really good oyster growth, and um, I think it's, um, it's a very robust reef. We get waves breaking on it all the time. So I had loaded up a movie, but uh, the movie didn't actually get picked with it. You know, another thing it's very easy to do with these, when you have those rastas with the oysters growing on them, you can just turn them vertically. Just put them in the sediment. And, and this is a little reef I built back in May along our shoreline and survived quite well. We got really new growth, uh, good uh, recruitment and growth. And just that simple little manipulation is giving us this beautiful little reef. So you could imagine making a, a line of a reef like that along a shoreline. Uh, we're making other shapes, it's called a little rotunda reef, you know, this little, almost like a reef ball type. And um, you know, if you're interested in creating fish habitat and other things, it's uh, a form that uh, could work very well. It's stackable, lightweight. Um, once this sort of lower ring gets down in the sediment a little bit, it's not moving anywhere. So, you know, what we're seeing with our materials leads us to sort of put together a, a table like this of the features and benefits of our material versus some of the other things that are available, such as um, oyster castles. I don't know if anyone's used those much in Florida. You know, they've been used quite a bit in Virginia and some other places. Uh, reef balls, you know, obviously a lot of reef balls out there in a lot of places that are doing really some nice uh, protection of shorelines, creation of habitat. The shell bags, loose shell, and then various types of rock. But in terms of um, promoting you know, live oyster growth, that open framework really seems to make a big difference, bringing in a lot of oysters and giving them the opportunity to grow in um, a way that, that makes a reef even stronger over time. And I don't have to worry so much about it. Small modular elements, we have a lot of versatility in reef design. It's lightweight, you know, it can be a really good product for handling by volunteers. Um, it's biodegradable. So, the issue of the boring sponge in, say, the shell or marl, where it's put where it doesn't belong, if we put our material where you know, we think we're going to get oysters, but we don't, it's eventually going to go away. I mean, you know, maybe three or four years, two years, but it's not going to be there. So if you know, you're really concerned about leaving something behind, if it doesn't work, then our material will accomplish uh, that disappearing action. Uh, Non-carbonate, so bio erroders won't get into it. Uh, as you saw with the, the reefs, you know, it's got some pretty good positional resilience. You know, yeah, any one of those single elements is not that strong, but when you put them all together, you know, they're pretty amazing in terms of how much um, strength is in that structure. Uh, easy to pre-seed, so if you want to move them around, uh, it's easy to do that. Remote setting would be another easy way to do it. And just, it seems like getting that reef off the bottom just a little bit makes a big difference in how well the oysters live. So, you know, at this point, we're just getting started with sort of manufacturing and distributing and making this product available to others. So we're kind of trying to figure out what our, our price points are. Uh, we have um, a company up in Pensacola, Pensacola Bay Oyster Company, that I've been working with the owner, Donnie McMahon, for uh, almost a year and a half now I met him. And so he's had some of our materials, has put them out, but 
we're hoping to get a sub-license agreement signed with Donnie next week. So in that area, of the, the panhandle, you know, he's going to be manufacturing and distributing and using in a, a lot of restoration projects up in that area, uh, this material. So we're beginning to really zoom, zoom in on a price point, but it's, I think, going to be competitive with a lot of the other uh, materials. Uh, shell bags, we worked with the Coastal Federation to think about how much it would cost to build a reef of a particular type if it was, was done by a commercial group, not with volunteers. And that came out to about $65 a linear foot. And for that aquarium project, we're in the range of about $75 to $80 a linear foot. So we'll be coming out with more information about the pricing, but also there are other alternatives a uh, way of, of thinking about it, and if you have, you know, like the Nature Conservancy or the Coastal Federation with big volunteer groups, you know, there could be um, certainly deployment by the volunteer groups, maybe even production of materials. So there are a lot of options that uh, you know, we are considering for getting restoration done with this product in, with different groups. So with that, if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer any of those, and we have material up here if like to come up and pick it up and answer your questions. Yes. So I have a question. You mentioned, I, I think, that the materials last about two to three years in the water. And what, oh, I'm sorry. Hi. Um, I have a question about the length that the materials last. And then what happens to the reefs after the material goes away? Like, for example, that open grid structure. That is going to be longer lived when the oysters are growing like we're seeing them now. Um, that first reef we built, we are now seeing those materials degrade over time. That's an area that um, right up against where that reef is, we have a lot of runoff. So it's not the best oyster growing along our shoreline there. And so um, some of that became exposed. And we're seeing it disappear without oysters on it after three years. Uh, but some of those reefs now where you know, you're really seeing that encasement with oysters. I don't think that material is going to disappear until the oysters go away. Right. When you build, um, build these and get the vegetation growing in behind it, mm -hmm. does that actually uh, help uh, water quality? And do they, um, does it take up nutrients so that you get better quality for the oysters? Have you done any studies on that? Well, I think that, you know, anytime you can put a good, healthy plant community along a shoreline, a native plant community, I mean, that's a great thing. And so I think, you know, you're putting plants there, they're taking up nutrients. If you've got good oysters growing along that, that shoreline as well, it can enhance the protection. But I think, you know, the nutrients that are coming off the oysters, the plants are absorbing a lot of that. So, yeah, I think it's a, it's a big improvement in water quality really focusing on the plants as well as the oysters. You know, the oysters, their big impact in water quality is going to be reducing turbidity, you know, taking out phytoplankton. Maybe some of that's harmful, maybe not. But, you know, they're fertilizing. They're putting DIN back in the water. So, are you collecting data on that? Uh, there are groups that are, that are working on that. So a lot of the projects we're working on are in collaboration with academic colleagues. So. We're not the group doing the monitoring of the structure and the oyster communities um, and all the other things like plant growth. That's being done by academic collaborators. So, you know, we don't have a conflict of interest in how that's being done and reporting of data. But it is, is it going to be available? Will it be available in the future? Yeah. Um, the monitoring that they're doing that shows, uh, it, well, actually the collaboration between the plants and the oysters. Yeah, the student uh, working on that will be back down to our lab to sort of see how things are now, sort of moving into a year and a half into that project. So we're, you know, we're in a sort of a senescent period for the plants in North Carolina. It's cold, they're sort of gone to sleep for the winter. But pretty soon those shoots are going to be coming from the roots that are spreading out. So the next thing that she's going to be doing is sort of looking how far those new shoots are coming up from those those pots, and I think she's going to see some some really pretty significant um, increases in sort of the extent of salt marsh growth behind those live oyster reefs. So that data will be coming out as papers. Right, I think yeah. That's really important. yeah. Hi. 
<laughs> for the aquarium project, I think it was, you mm -hmm. said that you did the cost estimate for. Right. What type of structure was that? Was that the bones and Rasta? With the or? log, sort of that stack of. With the log. Yep. So okay. we're really looking along that shoreline to try to build up a sediment load behind it, a bed behind it that the plants will will grow into. You know, it's a, an area where, you, again, you've got these different sorts of erosion problems, sort of the ramped or the scarp. That area we started on was, was kind of a ramped uh, shoreline, but um, they wanted to see more of the, the logs and the potential for bringing that, that community up higher in elevation than it currently exists. And, you know, with rising sea levels, you know, it's going to be a race to, to try to stay ahead of it. So I think any elevation, sort of natural, elevation that we can bring in from sediment accumulation, plant growth, it's a good thing. And, and a thank you. And a follow-up to that, on the logs, I, I know that you were documenting some recruitment of the Spartina within the logs, but I, I didn't hear or see a recruitment of oysters on the logs in particular. There was some recruitment on those logs, so okay. the recruitment we were seeing um, on the log face, um, facing the water, you know, was that as it sort of came under and you had a bit of a shaded area. We had a lot of good recruitment on the, the logs. They are going to catch and grow. Um, what we're going to do on that shoreline is go back and put a fringing reef in front of it with the frosts and bones. Really try to beef up the, the oyster along that shoreline as part of the resilience plan for, for that, that shoreline. Yeah, thanks. Excellent talk. Um, so habitat selection seems to be really critical about the success for oyster restoration. So in the lagoon here, where we don't have that higher and regular rise and fall in tides, do you have any advice on basically uh, how we can best select a habitat for <coughs> something like this? Well, we went with Jim and Nicolette yesterday and visited some of the sites. And yeah, you can, again, you can sort of look around at structures that are in that environment to get an idea of you know, what the height of that oyster growth zone is. Um, and some of the shoreline, you know, it was from the, the depth of the, the sediment, it was kind of right at the bottom of that uh, oyster growth zone. So you have about 12 inches of available space to work with. Um, and that's around the inlet where it's pretty high salinity waters. Um, you know, as I was saying earlier, when I went to Bureau this morning and looked at the, uh, the, the Highway 60 bridge, um, there's tremendous growth potential for oysters there. So there's a, a really nice intertidal growth zone, but then they keep growing down that structure. So I think the salinity is low enough there that there could be a lot of effective subtidal restoration done sort of in the mid part of the estuary between Sebastian and Pierce. So again, any data you have on salinity that you can sort of bring to the table is just exceptionally helpful. And it has to be more on a tidal cycle or can it be more seasonal? I mean, if you have a low salinity and a high salinity regime, is that, that good enough for keeping the parasites and the sponges at bay? In some places it might be. Mm -hmm. You know, again, every location is going to sort of be a, a bit, bit different. different. So um, it's going to de depend on the presence of predators and pests. And a lot of that could be you know, these events that are fairly random mm -hmm. but can be catastrophic in one way or another. So, you know, there are areas where I think you can be confident that you're going to have an oyster reef there if that's your target for you know, a good bit of time without a, a major disaster. There are other places where you're not going to have as much confidence in that reef lasting. Even, you know, if you get it going and it looks good. And I think that for the people who you know, are sort of asking for these restoration projects to be done, you've got to be very upfront with them about this is... These are the potential outcomes, and they're not all successful, but we're going to try to use the best available ecological data to give you, along your shoreline or on you know, your stretch of estuary, what's got the highest likelihood of being, being successful. We don't want people using this if we know it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. it's the worst thing for anybody's product, you know, even gel bags, put them out there and like, well, they don't work. So nothing was going to work in that environment. So. Okay, thanks. And, and Niels, one added element down here, of course, is our mangrove is one of our natural um, 
plants along the shorelines rather than salt marsh mm -hmm. until you get up a little further north in Florida. So it um, adds some extra elements, but it does kind of attest to your um, bo bone structures in the vertical manner could very well mimic um, mangrove roots for settlement and attachment and that sort of thing. Yeah, and the mangrove roots you know, are a great substrate for oysters. <laughs> Saw a lot of oysters growing on mangrove roots this morning. So there's the potential to use our, our material in, in other ways. And you know, if you're in a high energy environment, perhaps where you're trying to establish a mangrove, but you know, it's kind of on the border, then I think we have ways of using our material to stabilize that environment give it enough protection to really get it big enough and rooted well that um, you know, it has a better chance of success in colonizing and, and growing. So we're, we're looking at um, various ways in which we can use this, not only with oysters, but in other ways with different plant communities, not only um, salt water, but also not just estuarine waters, but fresh water as, as well. Hi. Hi. Um, great talk. I have so many ideas and so many questions. Um, but ultimately, one of the things I would like to know is how long did it take you to make some of those different designs um, using, I'm, I'm assuming, yourself and your partner and maybe some people with you? Um, like, do each of them have their own particular, like, I can say this will take me for the Rasta design, that'll take me like five minutes to do ultimately, or those kinds of things? Do you have that all worked out? Yeah, we're working on that all the way from prepping the material to mixing the cement, cutting the cloth, which we currently purchase as bolts that are four feet wide and 220 feet long. And when we first started thinking about, it, okay, well, we've got to quarter that or you know cut it into the thirds. Well, how are you going to do that? And take scissors, and then no, we're not going to do that. So we've got a couple different methods that involve masonry saws or big machetes and. You get pretty inventive and figure out how to make things faster. And again, we're just getting started with this, so there's going to be a lot of improvements in the production, a lot of um, cost savings. So hopefully, reductions in prices where we're kind of thinking they need to be now because of scale, reduced uh, cost of goods, just in bulk purchase and things like that. We're also, you know, we're not terribly pleased with using Portland cement. There are all sorts of environmental issues with production of Portland cement. But there are also new generations of cement that are being developed that are CO2 absorbing. So we're hoping that we can look to incorporate those into the product and really get away from Portland cement. So, you know, there are a lot of um, other ways in which the, the benefits of the material can be perhaps realized for people with projects. You know, it can be through habitat mitigation or carbon sequestration, if you're saving a marsh and actually regrowing it, you know, there may be some mechanisms for trying to get some, some monetary benefit out of that. So there are all sorts of things that are developing as we're realizing how bad the problems are that we're facing and the ways in which we can make the best possible decisions in restoring and creating, in a lot of ways, brand new, brand new habitat. I'm glad you mentioned the cement thing because that was going to be my next question. <laughs> yeah, if I can have another go. Yeah. Uh, talking about cement, do you add oyster shell and other things to your cementitious materials to try and? We've aggregate? used. Um, we've also added lime mm -hmm. to our our cement, and in some ways, you know, that is a, a bit of a CO2 capture strategy. I mean, lime will convert to calcium carbonate, but it with the absorption of CO2. Um, that's possible. You know, so, but in terms of um, yeah, is question again? Well, I was sort of wondering, I, I assume oysters are gregarious, oh, right? Yeah. So if yeah. I add oyster shells to the... Well, yeah, they're gregarious <coughs> in terms of sort of the live mm -hmm. portion of the oyster and the communication, you know, hey, I'm here. Mm -hmm. you know, come settle next to me. But in terms of that being oyster shell, it, I don't think it matters really much to an oyster as to what it settles on. The important thing is when it does settle as a small new recruit, mm -hmm. it's got some refuge, some protection. If you just look at PVC poles and other things or dock pilings, now you can go to an area where you might expect you'd see a lot of oysters, but they just get picked off, fish and other things, crabs. 
So, you know, sort of just the, the structural complexity we can add to this material gives us that benefit. But in terms of it being cement, Portland cement or cement lime or some other you know, hard material, I don't think the oysters really care. But, you know, the gregarious settlement is a, a real sort of phenomenon you can capture um, you know, the benefits of. You know, when we're bundling our materials, creating some safe space, like the, the rastas, if we bundle those in five and put them out to precede, we get you know, tremendous recruitment and survivorship on the inside of those bundles. And get a little bit of you know, some of the, the babies settling in there. Mm -hmm. you know, the signal's on that, hey, you know, come on, the party's on. Because you know, from an ecological or evolutionary perspective, a single oyster on its own is a, you know, it's a reproductive dead end. You know, they're broadcast spawners, there's male and females, and they have to be together. So you know, an oyster all by itself is not going to be doing that unless it's just not going to. So there, there's very strong um, gregarious settlement behavior among a lot of those broadcast spawning animals. So I think that's, that's an important thing to consider and to capitalize on. But also in a restoration project, you know, that's another consideration to, to bring into bear is that oysters, you know, they start out typically male. And then as they age, they switch to female. So if you're looking to jumpstart a broodstock population, if you're just moving one cohort, you know, you look, expect those to, to grow up over time, switch sex, a portion of them, and then you get a reproductive population. You know, and the whole time you're sort of losing population if it's not being replenished. But as the younger ones come in, those will be the males as the others grow up. So in some of the restoration projects we're doing, like the, the Oyster Highway Project in the New River, we were bringing in mature patties like this along with some of those other like this. So we have a mix of age. Um, what we were also doing was collecting off that intertidal sandbar clusters of oysters that were nearly three years old plus newly recruited oysters. So we had a, a very wide range of ages. We were taking you know, 200 bushels of those, moving them to that artificial reef and planting those on the reef. So you know, we were expecting we'd have a spawning opportunity right away. So that's another thing to consider, you know, these reproductive characteristics, how you can best utilize that information to get the most bang for your buck as quickly as possible. Um, my question is about ease of installation, especially in poor, poorly accessible areas where you might not have easy access from a barge or equipment. How easy or difficult is it to install these different products? It, it varies, you know, for, say, the, the bones that are the vertical supports for the reef framework. Um, all the work that we've done has been off uh, basically a 14-foot John boat. Um, just bringing materials out. And we're going into shallow water. We couldn't bring a big barge into some of those areas or even a bigger boat. Um, but putting those into the sediment it can be very easy. If it's soft enough mud, you can just push it. If it's a, a sandy bottom, we we'll just use a small bilge pump with a battery and a, a hose and just jet them in real quick. So we can put one of those in in less than a minute. So you know, by using some of the tools that are available to us, we can sort of make this process pretty quick in reef building, but you get better with experience, and so that's part of what you know, we want to bring out to people too, is this is you know, how we're doing it and doing it most efficiently. In some of those soft sediment areas, what we're doing is, is laying down a board framework so that uh, that basically says, you know, here are, are all the pieces of the reef where they need to go, but then we can walk on it and not sink in the mud. And so there you know, are ways in which you can work with the, the environment to you know, speed up the, the construction of the reefs as much as possible. So some of the other things, just um, like the, the patties and the ones that we're moving that are already preceded, that, that's going to take a barge. Um, and in that project, what we're also doing is building reefs with oyster castles. And 
So those are those sort of Lego-like blocks that piece together, and they you know, they work really well in, in some environments and are very robust um, in high energy environments. So it's not a not a bad material, but we're using those as sort of a, a material that's not ours, but it's hard substrate in those same re um, development sites to see how well we're doing with new recruits coming onto those. But that's going to be a big project. I mean, those things are, are heavy, 35 pounds, I think, a piece, something like that. So a lot of this work does get, yeah, it requires an effort. Now, the logs are, I mean, again, you can come up after this thing. Virtually none of this is done. So, again, in terms of volunteers working to do that, um, it's not a big deal. And what we do to sort of pin these in place is we use bamboo stakes and just bring out a, a masonry uh, bit, or a drill, and just put a hole through this really quick and then just drive the stake right through it. But even when these get wet, get a little sediment in them, settle into the bottom, they, they don't want to move. We're finding this stuff is, is really pretty, pretty good in high energy environments. I wanted to ask about your three-dimensional graph there, looking at salinity and mm -hmm. um, depth and your sweet spots for subtital and intertidal. How, how well do you think that translates to different genetic stocks of oyster and sponge, you know, in our lagoon environment as opposed to North Carolina and Chesapeake? I'm just really beginning to learn about oysters in North, in Florida. Um, and, you know, I do have questions kind of along those lines. Some of the oysters we saw yesterday, I'm not even sure they were the eastern oyster. It might have been the horse oyster. Um, and, you know, a smaller oyster, it may be more robust in some environments. Um, so I think knowing something about taxonomy, you know, is that really that species that you think it is? And I think there's some discussion here that in the higher salinity areas, the oysters don't grow as well. I mean, that's not our experience in North Carolina, but yeah, it may be the case here with the stocks that you have. So, again, it's just educating ourselves about what we're dealing with and you know, for that region, what is possible with uh, what the animals are offering us. Right. So there's the potential genetic diversity of the oysters, but then also of the boring sponge. And I didn't know how much the work sponge, there was on the salinity tolerance of the, the boring sponge. I think in general that the, the sponge is, again, is probably going to vary geographically. You know, these boring sponges that Klein and Salata will go from, you know, South America to New England into Canada. Even Europe mm -hmm. may not be the same boring sponge. You know, exact it's species. It's the same but, bitch. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I think the freshets are really key to eliminating that most aggressive boring sponge, which is the one that's high salinity adapted. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some other things, again, sort of in the reproductive life history of these, it's interesting that sponges make what are called gemules. So if they get into a stressful environment, they basically make a little spore that they can regenerate from. And what we find is the ones that are adapted to the low salinity waters actually do that. And so you can see these after a big freshet, you can go out and sort of pry open some shells and you kind of see the gemules in there. And you know that when the conditions are right, that sponge is gonna come back out. Mm -hmm. But that one's not as aggressive or those species that are low salinity adapted, they're just not as bad and as, as aggressive as that high salinity adapted salad, which I don't think forms gemules and, and really does take a hit from a big brush. So what is your thought on for the subtital oysters in the 10 parts per thousand salinity regime? You know, do you think that using uh, limestone coquina is, is viable or you would still have concerns? I think about it probably is viable. Um, in North Carolina, there's another borer that um, hasn't been very well um, studied, and that's the, the mud blister worm, the polydora. And it seems to be a problem in the lower salinity waters, particularly with the marl, because it's so easy for those organisms to slide right into that and make a home. And you do see the, this, the lower salinity oyster populations suffering from you know, pretty severe mud blister worm infestations. So again, you know, it might be better if you just get away from the marl, because you think about the, the structure of those marl mounds, you've got the big Lots of interstitial space that's you know 
couldn't be there on an oyster reef. A real oyster reef is kind of a veneer of you know, living oysters with sediment filling in and sort of building up. So you don't have that kind of substrate surface and structure available in a real oyster reef that you have on those moral mounds. So I'd, I'd be careful about moral, for sure. I just, I just had a quick question. Um, how do you attach the Rastas uh, to the other projects that you said that you relocate them? Are you still using wire or? When we initially build the reef framework, we'll take galvanized steel wire and we'll just wire them together. And that, you know, if they're preceded, you get the oysters starting to grow already. Um, the bones we typically don't precede, but then we do see settlement on those pretty quickly and good oyster growth. So yeah, I think in a lot of areas, you don't need to worry about preceding. You could just go ahead and build structure with just sort of the naked components. And um, if it's one of those environments that you know, you get good recruitment, have it in the right place, you're very quickly going to get a reef that... Um, but with, say, the Oyster Highway project and the reefs we're going to build with the transferred uh, patties, we'll create a reef that is four patties too high, so eight plus two on top, and then a bamboo stake down the middle of those. And we've had those out in the New River already. We, we built some early on with material we already had um, seeded, and they went through Hurricane Florence and Michael. And we lost a few of them, but most of them did a pretty good job of coming through that. The bam bamboo lasted? Yeah. Bamboo will typically last in those environments that we're using it for a year or more. So, and, we're, and we're talking about uh, one inch, typically. Did you have any issues with permitting when you introduced a new material to use for oyster restoration? Um, not really. Uh, in North Carolina, you know, concrete cement-based products are, are already approved. Um, and the plant-based stuff, I mean, no one was really going to argue with that. So, uh, you know, we did sort of go through a bit of a review with the Division of Coastal Management. Um, we've gone through major permit reviews for the Oyster Highway Project all the agencies involved in those. So, you know, they've all had a, had a look at it and uh, no one raised any significant concerns about it. So at this point, um, you know, permitting has not been a, a problem. I you know, can't yet anticipate why somebody would have a problem with it, particularly if we continue to make it better with CO2 absorbing cements and things that uh, will be really pretty, pretty green and friendly. So I'm curious about the sedimentation issue. How do you find that sweet spot where the reefs aren't so successful at attracting the sediment that they don't get buried? Or uh, is it something you have to monitor over the long term or adapt over the long term? I think that, um, say in the Tidal Creek where we, we saw that sediment build up, um, it depends upon you know what your expectations and your outcomes are looking for. Um, if you just build reefs in that along that shoreline in that tidal creek with oyster shell, it will eventually begin to look like some of the other natural reefs along that shoreline where you know, they also began to grow oysters, accumulate sediment. So now you're looking basically at a, a reef along the shorelines where it's a lot of soft sediment sort of in the restructure, but you've got oysters sort of growing through that. With ours, at the elevation, at the top of the reefs, we're getting already pretty close to the top of the growth zone in that tidal environment. So I'm not expecting we'll see much more sediment accumulating sort of on top of all those oysters that are fairly high up. Uh, unless we put marsh in there, then you, know, you start getting some good plant growth and you should get more accumulation of sediment within there. So it may be that we start with that oyster reef, but pretty soon we've gone to a platform that is dominated by salt marsh. Um, so again, it's understanding what is going to happen after seeing you know, sort of some of the trajectories that we can take, and then really understanding that you know, that's going to be the outcome in that environment. You go out to that exposed shoreline where there's lots of energy and you don't get that deposition, you know, it's, it's really growing 
a robust reef, a you know, real live oyster cover that's uh, it's enormous. Thanks. Neil, so, thanks so much for taking time to, to be with us. Um, you touched on so many questions that we've been talking about for years. Yeah. And as you can imagine, uh, quite a bit of research already happening here. But um, you, you've helped us in, in lots of ways. And so we um, are glad to continue this conversation. So I had a couple questions. Though. The first is, can you describe for us uh, the nature of the proprietary aspects of this? You mentioned some patents being involved. Right. Yeah. Um, it's as simple as combining those two materials. Seriously. Uh, so when you are filing for patent applications, you know, they're going to be looking for novelty and prior art. Right. So, you know, it was surprising to us that we could not find an example of these two materials being sort of mixed, these plant fiber cloths. I mean, people have put a lot of plant fiber into cements to make them biodegradable or to, to do other things with them, you know, to increase nutrient release from a cement, which... I don't understand why that for, for oysters. But this combination, you know, apparently we couldn't find it. The patent attorneys couldn't find prior art. So we were on solid ground with filing patent applications. And you know, it's, it's just those two materials used in, you know, in combination like this that uh, provided the opportunity to seek patents. And, you know, when you start thinking about drug development, you don't get drugs on the market unless they're patented, basically, um, because somebody has exclusivity and the opportunity to recover costs by being able to exclude others from, from making that product. Right. And so we have that opportunity as well to you know, say that you know, we're the, the ones that have the, the legal right to, to make and distribute and use this material. Um, so as a business, that's a good strategy. You go on Shark Tank, and the first things they'll ask you is, "What's your IP?" So, you know, this is our our IP patent applications. So, through sublicensing, you know, we're working, looking to work in different areas and you know, bring this material out and bring the know-how out of along with it. Right. Yeah, th this is great for all of us to know, um, and appreciate what you had to say about you know having volunteer labor, you know, as part of that whole process. That's something we all rely on and, right. and can easily bring to the table. So mm -hmm. good, good to hear. So, so as you work with these iterations of the concrete mix, I've heard a couple of things. I heard Portland cement. I wonder which type was that. And then also um, some of these other things you've added, lime and so forth. You know, mm -hmm. is there anything else to add to that discussion? It's really just a yeah, Portland cement and... So, so which, which one? Which, which Portland is Yeah, I'll have to go back and look at which type, okay. you know. Yeah. And it does make a difference as to which one you Absolutely. use. I mean, if you yeah. try to use a, you know, a sacrete or a quickcrete, yeah. like, I mean, so we found some that work well and uh, stuck with those. Yeah. And the lime, you know, you sort of make a lime putty out of it, so you take your powdered lime, hydrated lime, and mm -hmm. mix it in with water and just let it sit. And so then take it out as that putty and mix it into that uh, Portland cement in yeah. various ratios and, and use that. Okay. All right. Good. Good to know. Uh, and then lastly, um, uh, I would imagine that in North Carolina, recruitment limitation is really not something you're dealing with at most of these locations. So has there been a site where maybe you felt like was recruitment limited? Uh, and that would include, have you done any sites out of North Carolina? Um, I gave Bo Lusk in Virginia some of the material last um, spring. So he put it out. Um, so he had patties, he had rostas, he had tufts, little oyster shell substitute. And they're in an area where they're not recruitment limited at all, very much like some of the eastern North Carolina yeah. regions. And you know, they, just, they got covered as thick as they do in North Carolina. Uh, Donnie, man, up in uh, Pensacola, has had some of the material as well, and you know, he's set some of those in uh, tanks, but I think he also just had recruitment from natural water coming through, and you know, again, just amazing looking reefs. In a very short period of time here in Florida, you know, the oysters grow much faster than they do up in, in North Carolina. So you know, I think that 
the combination of these hatcheries with our materials is going to be a big benefit, particularly here in Florida, because you know you do have the, the limitations of stock staying within an estuary. So you know the hatcheries can go in, get oysters from that particular estuary, spawn them, set them on the material, and that can go back into that estuary. You know I think too the We've got some opportunities maybe in Apalachicola Bay to help there with trying to recover some of the oyster population. I think that's one of the, the first areas that you know, we're looking to, to move towards. We'll certainly be talking with people in FWC and all the other you know, agencies. Kent Smith up in Tallahassee you know, has, has seen our material. Um, and actually, the Atlantic Coast Fish Habitat Partnership funded some of the reef building in North Carolina. Right. Yeah. Kent's my boss, and I sit on ACFIP, so. Yep. Yeah. Yep. We tried to cross paths with you at Ray, and I guess we never never saw each other there, yeah. but uh, we did a special session about the Indian River Lagoon and potential shellfish restoration, and so I don't know if you were able to sit on any of that, but no. we've had some of these discussions already, but uh, look forward to working with you more. Thanks so much. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Jim Oppenborn. I'm with St. Lucie County. I first just wanted to thank everybody for coming, uh, especially Nicolette and Niels when they offered to have this uh, conf conference uh, here. I just jumped at the, the possibility. Um, I'm mostly an artificial reef coordinator. Uh, I do fish habitat. Um, um, but we do have an oyster reef program as part of that fish habitat. Um, I wanted to just thank our local partners. As, as a fish guy, I'm not really an expert at oysters, but I rely a lot on my, my close contacts with the Florida Oceanographic Society, the National Estuary Program, uh, uh, Florida, uh, Florida Sea Grant, um, the Aquatic Preserve, and even the Brevard Zoo has helped us out quite a bit. So I rely on everybody to help me out because uh, I get most of my management decisions. I make them using consultation from these groups. All right. Um, why do I care about oyster reefs? Well, we have a number of fish species. I'm not sure if you can see that from back there. But this is a group called the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council Snapper Grouper Complex. Okay, that's the management group for all of the hard bottom communities in the South Atlantic Fisheries jurisdiction. Um, you see the fishes that are circled on that chart are the fishes that you might expect offshore St. Lucie County. Um, the fishes that are both circled and highlighted, those are various species that we've actually documented on our artificial reefs offshore. But if you look even closer, you'll see a number of species have cross-hatching in them. Those are fish species that require a certain portions of their life history to live in the Indian River Lagoon or you know, shallow waters. All right? Oyster reefs being a very, very important habitat, what they call essential fish habitat, that was one thing that I wanted to make. Uh, both the habitat and the water quality are very, very essential for uh, ensuring that we have a continuous supply of fish recruiting offshore envi uh, environments. All right, something that was mentioned before uh, about the volunteer efforts, and this is one of the reasons why I really like these products. Uh, very lightweight. I asked Niels about this yesterday. I said, you know, we get all of our you know, work is really done by volunteers. I mean, I do a lot of the perming work and the consultation with uh, the real scientists like Vincent and, and Leroy, uh, but the volunteers provide the backbone of all this work. And in order for us to utilize some of these things, they have to be volunteer friendly. And they look, and they, and they felt very, very lightweight. One of the things that, and, and I, I tend to be more pragmatic in my 
Oyster Reef uh, building. Uh, one of the things that uh, I like about the Oyster Reefs here um, is we tend to get uh, sand accumulation. I think in, in several of our Oyster Reefs, this one being one of the spawns locally, uh, the sand has really built up, and this allows both shoreline stabilization and seagrass recruitment. Um, but this is something, shoreline stabilization, very, very important to our oyster reef program here. Again, the aforementioned seagrass recruitment on five of the seven oyster reefs that we built, you know, five to seven different areas that we built, uh, we've re we've seen the seagrass recruitments. Uh, this is very important. Oyster reefs being essential fish habitat, and I, of course, do all of my work uh, towards uh, fish habitat and fish. Um, so if the oysters don't necessarily grow that well here, um, but there are a number of things, um, seagrass being one of them, considered essential fish habitat, and it's very, just as important to get the seagrasses regrowing here as oysters. Uh, not just to show I'm not totally a cold-hearted ichthyologist fish guy, um, we do have about 30 species of birds that have uh, recruited to our, in, well, we build our, our oyster reefs intertidally because our salinity is so high. Um, in this case, being a nice wood stork, um, we've had several different species of birds. Uh, in this case, we have a modeled mallard duck. This is Spoil Island SL18B. Uh, you'll see him, he's, or she, right, right there. Um, and we see a number of species, as I said before. Um, the biota, okay. I don't believe in single species management. Uh, which is good because our oyster recruitment here, uh, and Neil said, oh, maybe you know you could try something different. Um, we tried to do intertidal oyster reefs to you know afford some protection against predation since we have higher salinity seawaters. Um, but one particular reef, our downtown oyster reef, by the time we got it permitted, um, seagrasses had grown in. Uh, after it was permitted, they built breakwater islands, and then the, the wave energy and structure was such that they had seagrasses, and I couldn't put our, any more oyster reefs intertidally. So uh, we put them subtidally, and we have the lobster, and we have the stone crab, and um, of course the fish, uh, the sheep's head, and that's a black crowned night here and there. Um, these are all growing subtidally, and Aside from the, the, the biota that's actually part of the, you know, surrounding the reef, uh, we actually have a number of uh, critters, if you will, inside the modules. We have crabs, we have shrimp, we have tunicates, we have sponges, we have all sorts of different types of worms. Um, Leroy, did I, min did I leave anything out? Okay. Uh, but it's really a whole community, not just the oyster shells that, that we're concerned about here. Finally, uh, well, not finally, but the use of biodegradable material. When I found out that these materials use, you know, concrete and, you know, plant materials, we've been trying for the longest time to, to steer clear from the, the plastics um, through our oyster modules. Uh, no biologist in their right mind wants to put a, a plastic in the environment. Uh, you know, it's it's okay. I mean, the oysters outgrow the the plastic, but it's just something about it is, is unsettling to me. Uh, we started out uh, about nine years ago. I think we did spoil island SL18B, and we used um, core or coconut husk fibers. And unfortunately, in the wave environment that the, that island is, we had probably elimination of the of the core modules within a month. Right, a little while later, we tried uh, using uh, dissolve bags. It's a compostable uh, material uh, made up in, by some um, dissolve netting uh, up in I, I want to say Ohio. 
but they didn't last much longer, maybe a couple, couple months. Uh, most recently, we've had the Kanika Corporation has developed a biopolymer from polymerization of palm tree oil. And um, those lasted about six months. I finally, I went back and, and I was expecting to see these things all great and, and perfect. And I went back and they had dissolved and I cried. Uh, but here you see the executives from the Kanika Corporation and uh, uh, they had actually traveled from Japan and from their distributor tra traveled from Texas to actually watch these students from Plum the Plumas State University spring break installing these biodegradable modules. So that's the, the closest we've had so far to having our modules last. All right. The flip side of um, the biological work, I am working in the Department of Public Works. So I work with all sorts of engineers, and I get to see things from the engineering perspective rather than the biological perspective. This is Indian River Drive after the 2004 hurricanes, okay? Francis and Jean. Um, we had severe destruction of uh, Indian River Drive, which is a, a road right next to Indian River Lagoon. Um, you see the cars overturned and you know all sorts of death and destruction and madness and mayhem. Um, part of this you know has to deal with shoreline stabilization. If you remember back the, the earlier slides, um, these oyster reefs that were built up next to uh, shorelines, actually help stabilize some sediments, actually increase the, sh the shoreline width. Uh, we're hoping that this will happen in the same location here. We have about 11 miles of shoreline between St. Lucie County and Martin Counties, and we wanna try to increase the stabilization. Um, our public works department is tearing their hair out, trying to figure out how they're gonna, you know, uh, stop this erosion. Um, you know, this is, um, happened twice since the hurricanes of 2004, just by simple rain events. Um, so uh, we're looking at oyster reefs from far more than just simply um, producing oysters. All right, short and sweet. I hope everybody has enjoyed it. Uh, any questions? Otherwise, feel free to come on up and take a look at the uh, modules again. Thank <laughs> you.